All right, here we go. It's a brand new Flyers Daily for Monday, the 23rd of October. Flyers Daily presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. We're going to talk about some goals. We're going to talk about some assists. And this season, the Flyers are teaming up with Penn Medicine for the Penn Medicine Assist. For every Flyers assist this season, Penn Medicine and the Flyers are going to be donating 30 pounds of food to local communities in need. So let's get a lot of apples in there and uh, help out Penn Medicine as well. Join us as he does every Monday from PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. It is Bill Meltzer. Bill, how you been? I'm doing really well. Um, you know, it's, it's exci- exciting times. Philly's a, a game away from the World Series. Uh, Flyers have played really well through the, f- the first five games for the most part, minus the Ottawa game. Um, you know, the uh, kind of a th- three and three weekend for the Phantoms, which is always interesting. So all good. Yeah, let's start there, actually. We're going to get to some Ask Billy questions, Scott. We've got some good ones coming in, but let me ask you about Ole Lixell. What a weekend for him. Oh, my. Yeah, five-goal five weekend for him. And uh, had a hat trick on Saturday and really just, just playing with a lot of speed and with a lot of energy. Um, he's been on been line with uh, Tanner Lezinski, and they've uh, really you know, they, they clicked together really well. Um Let's go to the other end of the spectrum because I know that head coach Ian LaPerriere had some very harsh words for Wade Allison. Uh, where does Wade Allison go from here? I think he's been demoted to the fourth line with the Phantoms. That's correct. Yeah, uh, he on, in Sunday's game that he he played he played on the fourth line um, after after Saturday's game in Hartford. Uh, Dan Freemuth, uh, a, a, formerly the Phantoms publicist, uh, then now is a broadcaster in Service Electric. He asked Lappy, um, you know, what have been your impressions of, of Wade Allison so far? He doesn't have a point, but are there other parts of, of his game that you've liked? And, and Lappy doesn't mince words typically, but he re- really went in on Wade. He said, no, I, I, have, I haven't liked anything about his game uh, in any of the four games um, that he is still basically feeling disappointed that he, he's not in Philadelphia. Um, that he, you know, he, he, he said basically be like Laz, be like Tano Lezinski, who's gone down with a great attitude playing in all situations and, and has been one of the Phantoms best players so far this year. So we kind of challenge him to kind of emulate what Lezinski is doing. Um, you know, kind of, kind of said that you, you can't always control your outcome, but you can control, you can control your attitude. You can, you control your effort. And he, and even you know, he said he knows Allison is a better player than he's played because he's seen it in the past, but he hasn't seen it in, in the first four games and basically moved him to the fourth line. That, that's a pretty clear message right there. Moved him off of the power play for Sunday's game. So um, Zade Wisdom got a shot on, on, the, uh, on the power play in, in Sunday's game. And, you know, basically he said the, ball, the ball's in his court. He said that he, he – you know, how he plays here, it's not just the Flyers who notice. Every organization notices this. And, um, you know, it's up to him where he goes from here. So that's a, that's a very, very clear message to a player. There was no – there's no ambiguity about that. So it, it's it's really up to the way to respond. Yeah, and in essence, this may be have to be like a wake-up call in a lot of ways for Wade. And, look, I understand the disappointment of not yeah. wanting to go down after spending a season in the NHL. That's all human, but – um you know, I, I imagine Lappy had that same exact conversation with him prior to having it with the media as well. So um, a bit of a crossroads for for Wade Allison right now, to say the least. Bill, let's talk about the big club. Uh, the game in Dallas on Saturday night, you know, they get off to a good start to the season. They're three and one. You have that shutout win over the Vancouver Canucks two to nothing. Then you have that game, really detail oriented hockey game against Edmonton, holding McDavid to no shots. And, you know, not only that, but the Couturier Atkinson. Owen Tippett line outscores the McDavid line to boot. And you go into Dallas, you get down 2 nothing early. Harrison looked a little rusty, which we'll talk about. Yeah. But they didn't pack it in any way. And that, that's a place where a lot of teams maybe early in the season or at any point may go, you know, it's just not our night, we'll move on to Vegas. They didn't. They battled back from a two-goal deficit to tie it by the end of the first. Then they're down two goals in the third, and they get two shorthanded goals. Uh, they're three in the game um, to get it tied up again. What does that game tell you? about the the process of forging identity well you know I, you started the resiliency obviously coming back twice from two goals down um 
the way that they did it. But but I'll I'll, I'll say on top of that too, uh, Flyers probably deserve still deserve to win. They actually outplayed Dallas most of the game. I shot them forty to twenty five. Yeah. Uh, other than maybe about the first five minutes of the game, took the Flyers a few shifts to, to kind of get going. Um, they were constantly pressuring Dallas. I mean, the, the Stars had 13 giveaways. A lot of some of those were unforced, but a lot of those were under pressure. I mean, the, the Flyers really outworked them. Dallas as a team is a very hard opponent to play against because uh, they have a lot of veterans, but they also have a combination of grit and speed and skill. And um, now both both clubs started their their backup goaltender for that game, so they, you know, so the Flyers got a little bit of a break in that game. I mean, Andres has just been incredible uh, last season and so far this year. But I, I really I really loved their approach to those two games. Um, I, I think in every game the Flyers have come away with points this season. So in other words, all but the Ottawa game, the Flyers have been the better team. So yeah. that's. Uh, you know, I when last year when the Flyers started out three and zero, it was deserved. But on the flip side, they really were relying very, very heavily on Carter Hart to to kind of steal a couple games from him. Uh, Hart's played Hart's played excellent hockey so far, but he hasn't had to steal a game. Yeah, he he has been good and he's made timely saves, but it hasn't yeah. been the volume that we saw last year. Yeah. I mean. Then generating offense last year. I mean, in the first 12 games last year where they went 7-3-2, and two, they scored thir- only 33 goals. And goals were hard to come by, which leads me to my next question. When you look at this team offensively, Bill, they're, they're much more uh, capable of scoring in the NHL than last year. That's not even really a debate. But why is it? Is it just sheer depth? Players taking the next step? Like, and additions like Bobby Brink has been – out of his mind, what is it about the offense that seems different to you? There does seem to be some system, you know, s- systematic approaches that are changed as well. Yeah, and I think the Flyers have been playing a lot faster, mm-hmm. um, coming out of their own, own end of the ice, getting up ice, establishing a forecheck, um, being willing to to put more pucks at the net, getting guys to the net. Um, I, I think that they've been considerably more aggressive in those areas. Um, I've really liked the way that the the York and Sanheim pairing in particular has has been able to push the pace a little bit. Um, when we've said this, we've said this many times on the show, and it's, it's not oh, just us. It's it's a hockey truism that the the puck moves faster than any skater. When you get the puck up to the forwards, catch them in stride, so, suddenly the team starts to look a lot faster. Um, and so far, they've, they've been able to play pretty fast. That, against Edmonton, that, that's as fast as I've seen the, a Flyers team play in, in a long time. Actually, actually, the Vancouver game, the second period of the Vancouver game, yeah. especially. But also with Edmonton, because Edmonton, they, there might not be a faster team in the NHL than the Oilers, and, and the Flyers actually, the Flyers look like the faster team in that game, just, just in how they move the puck. And um, so I, I think these, these are all areas that, that hopefully can become a consistent part of the identity. What would you know? How you go into every game? Because a, a team might have more guys with better foot speed, but if you can play faster as a team and, and generate more pressure, you're gonna you're gonna have the better of the play more than you're defending. Um, again, the one game was the the Ottawa game was the big the big outlier because the Flyers got nothing going in that game. Um, but uh, every other game so far, I mean, the Flyers have had a really good approach. Um, you saw you saw the Dallas game because the, the other games they were playing from ahead uh, that they won. This is a game where the Flyers were playing from behind and they didn't they didn't panic, they didn't uh, they didn't abandon the way the way that they need to play, and that that was encouraging to see. I mean, would you like to get two points? Absolutely, but it, there there was there were a lot of positives to take from it. Bill, what's the reason for the heightened level of Travis Sanheim's game? I was asked about this on a podcast that I was a guest on. And they, they asked me, they said, you know, is he the player that, you know, won the Barry Ashby trophy a couple of times? And I said, no, he's not that player. He looks like a better player now. He looks more, you know, decisive than ever before, more willing and more able in board battles just because of the added strength. But the way he's defending the blue line and the red line, for that matter, you're looking at Edmonton game, the Faraby goal. He defends the red line extremely well. He's defending, but he attacks and he tail whips that puck. 
and gets it up, and they go on that two-on-two crisscross, turns into a two-on-one, Faraby puts it in from Brink. But the read on that play is is a guy that's just being more aggressive and assertive, and to me, it's confidence. And it's it, this is a weird thing to say, but he looks like a player that's playing more like a leader than a player that's playing along with teammates and following. Yeah, for sure. This is the guy who, if someone's struggling, um, you want you want that player on his line. Um, one of the things that uh, one of the things that uh, John Tortorella emphasized last year. And I, I, I think it's still an, I, still an area the Flyers as a team need to get to. It's an area some players need to get to. Um, he, he basically said that anybody can play well when things are, are flowing for a team. I mean, you, you just kind of you know, just ride the wave with everybody else. It's when you're trying to establish something, or especially when the game isn't going your way, who's going to be the guy who stabilizes it? Who's going to be the guy who makes a play that turns the momentum the other way? Konechny's kind of taking that on for himself. And, um, you, I mean, it, it, it speaks for itself what he's been doing. Uh, hopefully the Flyers can get some more players that, that are that are, are doing that. I mean, I, Couturier, when healthy, is the guy that can help you stabilize the game defensively and then turn defense into offense. Um, you know, a, a guy who can score a goal seemingly out of nowhere. Um, you know, sometimes they have guys that are capable of it. So, I mean, but they're, but they're, you know, they, they're the seed, the seeds of it. You, you know, it has to grow. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, but I mean, but Kinecki really is playing, playing like a leader, like, like a guy who just, okay, you know, follow me. And it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's really great to see. It was, it hasn't been an overnight process. No, it hasn't. And look at it, it. People, he, he's left a lot of people wanting more for, some seasons um, to me, he looks like a very complete hockey player right now. Just so confident in what he's going to do. I mean, he scores that second shorthanded goal. You see him go behind the net and he is directing traffic like a composer with an orchestra saying, put the puck here. And he goes right there and the puck is delivered and he just bangs it into the open net. And that's a player that the game is just moving at his speed. And, and he plays with a lot of pace to begin with. Um, Bill, one of the things, you know, John Tortorella has talked about quite a bit is you know, the notion of mistakes and making mistakes. And you got to make mistakes sometimes to make plays. There is a, a play that happened in the Edmonton game that to me is like the poster child for that. And it's the assist that Owen Tippett had to Cam Atkinson for the breakaway goal. Because Tippett's kind of on the left side. He's playing the left side in his off wing. Yep. And he's coming up through the neutral zone. And Sean Couturier on a 45-degree angle has got a ton of ice in front of him. For I'm, I'm saying to my headman, headman, headman. But he doesn't. What he does is he threads the needle to Atkinson sneaking in behind the defender, and it ups the quality of offense by a factor of 50. Atkinson goes in and undresses Campbell and scores. But that's a player that's willing to make a mistake because when he's made mistakes in the past, it hasn't put his butt on the bench. That's what that has to be. That's the effect of consistency and accountability in coaching. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I think there is something very much to be said for not being afraid to make a mistake, to know there's some leeway. If you make a mistake, you're going to go over the boards again, you know, yep. next time around. I, I think that that's very important. Yeah. It was just a tremendous pass. And it, look, if that pass may not make it eight out of 10 times, but it did exactly. on that time, on that, on that occasion. <laughs> and that's a big yeah. thing. And a big yeah. Thing and, 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 and um, you know, there was I'm trying to, there was, there was a play like, like last night, actually uh, the Tyson Forster, he lost a battle, but then he had a takeaway a, a couple seconds later. Yeah, and that you know he actually you know picked uh, picked the guy's pocket. Now that's nice to see. You lose a battle, okay, fight the next battle, and that's uh, that, that that's all part of that process. Part of the process, Bill, is going to be for Sam Harrison to figure out how to stay sharp when playing much less than he did last year. It was 19 days between when he played his last preseason game to the game against Dallas. And he looked a little rusty. He was off his angle a little bit on that first goal that beat him high blocker. I think the Hintz goal, the third goal of the game, was a byproduct of the first goal because he shaded too far to the short side against Rupe Hintz, and he beat him long side. But he, he did settle down in the third, played well in the overtime, and that's a good thing. But learning how to be a backup that plays once every four and a half, five games is not easy to stay sharp because practices just aren't designed for you 
to be in game conditions. Um, but that's going to be something he's going to have to fight through. Yeah, for sure. Especially early in the season when you don't have back to back. So there's not yep. these natural points where you, you know, you, you can circle that this is probably going to be one of your, one of your starting opportunities. Um, and then it also it's challenging because not only, not only did Sam not play since the next to last game of the preseason, that was a game against Boston. We all, he play, he went the distance, but he only saw 14 shots for the game. Yeah. And, and I don't think more than uh, more than six in any period. So he was never he never really got tested in that game. So that's you know that so it was really you know you not that you want to be peppered with shots, but but you'd like to at least get get a work in. Um, so it's really been a while since he he played any kind of a meaningful hockey game. Um, I noticed that uh, you know he gave the hint goal, and then they kept testing him. To the to the stick side over the pad, yeah, they and he 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 caught a break on at least one that hit the post and beat him again. But what I what I like about uh, Urson in that game and really since since he's come over and to North America is that he has a great compete level to him because uh, as you as you noted he settled in, in the third period. You know it, it's easy something ah just not my night you know and then just continues to go downhill. Um, in that third period, uh, the Flyers had a few breakdowns in that period, had, had to face a couple breakaways. Game really could have gotten out of hand. Um, he kept them in striking distance. Uh, two is tough. You're not, you're not figuring you're going to score two shorthanded goals in the same kill. But, but still, they, they were still in the game. They weren't, they weren't out of it. And you, know, you got to give a goal, goalie credit for that. He, he ultimately gave them a chance to, to come away with points. Um, but I do think that going forward, when he hits stretches, long stretches without playing, that that's part of being, you know, that, that, that is a big part of being a backup goalie. Um, is that it's are not more suited be, for a veteran, Bill? It it can be, it yeah. can be. Um, I, I I mean, because so much of it is mental, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's a, there's the physical part of it too. Um, but by the same token, if you're trying to develop him. You know, I, I think that he did well enough in the American League. You want to see him in the NHL, but the Flyers aren't in a one in one of those one A one B situations. Carter Hart is your number one goalie. Yeah. So, you know, he if Sam is at some point in his career uh, a one A one B or an undisputed number one, that to me this is this is a step in the process. It's it's good experience, but I, I think sometimes it is a little bit a little bit easier for. A veteran who has has played the backup role before, yeah. or you know, he's kind of just experienced a variety of things in his career to, to know how to keep himself um, mentally sharp when when he goes a while without playing. If you remember, if you remember, and I I don't even know how these guys did it back back in the past. I remember you and I one time interviewed Bobby Taylor. Yeah, and and uh, this was back in here when there were no goalie coaches. And Chief in particular might only get into one game every six weeks. Yeah. Um, so you know, good good luck staying sharp. Good good luck when you have you know when you don't have a a goalie coach to kind of help steer you in there. I mean that, that had to be an impossible situation for those guys. You had you had to try to stay sharp and in practice where the you get no sympathy from the, the position players because they're shooting to score. Yeah. You know. So it's uh, are not designed for the goalie. They are most certainly not designed for the goalie. No. And. You know, I, I, I have a lot of admiration for the guys who, who played the role that Wayne Stevenson or, or Bobby Taylor or early in his career, Bob Froze had to play because they, they didn't, didn't get too many chances to play. At least, at least now you have all the video to study. You do have a, you have a, a good quality of coaching available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it still, still is challenging. Goalie is still one of the hardest positions in sports. Uh, but I think it went from virtually impossible to, uh, you know, just, just extremely difficult. Yeah. I mean, even as recently as Martin Brodori, I mean, he played 78 games in a season of 82 at 34 years of age to boot. (laughs) I mean, that's crazy. Um, that's a hard position to be in for a backup goalie. And I think part of it too, is kind of a guy who was a starter and transitioned to be an NHL backup knows he's gone through it, what it takes to be an NHL goalie. And even if you have all the confidence in the world in yourself and like Sam Harrison's got some swagger to him, 
Um, and you could ask him, you could say, Hey, Sam, are, are you an NHL goalie? And he's going to say yes. And, and he's convinced he is. Um, but he hasn't kind of been an NHL goalie yet just because he hasn't played enough games. He's only played in 13 NHL games and, you know, going through all the different ramifications. Like that game was a, a tricky game. I thought for him too, it wasn't chalk. He didn't get a chance to just kind of feel the puck and get into a rhythm based on how that first period went. But uh, nonetheless, let's get to our Ask Billy questions, and let's start here with Vinit K. Singh. He says, which one of the following themes in the first four, now five games, will have the biggest impact on expediting the rebuild if they continue? Number one, Coots being the old Coots, which is kind of Coots being the young Coots, uh, Travis Konechny being a 90-point player, or Travis Seinheim being a top pair D. So which one of those will have the biggest impact? Geez, the, the, you are splitting hairs here. This is very difficult because they all will have a huge impact. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're all crucial. Um, if if Sanheim can keep playing at the level he's playing, play twenty something minutes a night every night, because one of the questions coming into the season is who's going to take those minutes that Provorov played. Um, Flyers are going to the Flyers are in the process of, of trying to build. A blue line for the long term. Um, some of the pieces that are here now are short-term pieces, so that's going to be an ongoing thing. But I think if I think if York continues to emerge and, and Sandheim, that's a, that's at least a piece of the puzzle. Either that, even if that down the line is your second pairing. Um, yeah. But I mean, having Couturier play play up to his, his Selkie Trophy kind of level, you you can just see what having. Couturier and, and Atkinson back has meant for the depth of the team. You know, that's uh, that's been a huge thing. And Konechny, la- last year, if he uh, if he hadn't had spent so much time with injury, he might have floored with 90 points. So not uh, not saying that he's not a crucial piece of the puzzle, you know, possibly wins the Bobby Clark trophy for you. But uh, but I think that, uh, you know, but I think that he's all, he was already kind of there. Yeah, um, 63 and, he just and 61 he, last year. Yeah, and, and so he's taken the next step past, you know, beyond that. We were talking about he's emerging as a complete player and as a leader. So that's uh, all critical and helpful. But I think that just in terms of trying to shape this team going forward as they're rebuilding, um, you know, solving the pieces of what their long-term blue line is going to look like to me is the number one challenge going forward. So – uh, I would I'd vote on the defense side just if I if I had to pick one, but they're all they're all important. Yeah, no doubt about it. And Konechny is certainly off to a great start. Uh, Flyers fan eighty eight says, "Will Travis Sanheim become one of the best deals in the NHL?" And it's it's so you know the dichotomy how it kind of flips really quick, Bill. Yeah. You know, over the summer it's oh they got to trade them. They can't go into this eight year term with you know, a no move clause for the first four and he's no good. And he's coming off the down year to him now being the team's minutes leader as well. I never thought the contract was out of, out of order from an AAV standpoint. It was pretty, I thought commensurate with what players of his stature in the NHL should get. It was a question of whether he was going to rebound and yeah. here in the early going, he certainly has. No, he has. Um, you know, he, when, when he won the Barry Ashby Trophy a couple of years ago, he had seemed to have broken through to another level in his game. He's been better than that this year. Um, I, I think the added the added strength, I think that, uh, you know, Travis sometimes was a guy who got a little down on himself, didn't always play with a ton of confidence after after some mistakes that happened. Uh, I think that he, he's had, you know, he's had some newfound, newfound swagger to his game. Um, you know, I, I hear some people – Every 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 player has has their haters and their critics, and I think people that don't understand the game, but also don't understand Travis Sanheim's game, you know, don't don't worry about how many hits he gets because that's not his game. Yeah, never will be, and, and and it never will be exactly. Just just look for you know, just look for his oh, like his all around two way game. I, I don't I don't care how tall he is, that that just isn't who he's going to be. But the the version of Travis Sanheim that the, the Flyers need from him, so far, so far, very early, very early going, but so far he's delivering on that. Yeah, he's been a revelation here early on for the Flyers, and we wondered about those minutes. Who's going to get them all? provorov has gone all those minutes, and boy, he's been eating them up. I, I already waved the white flag, Bill. My bold prediction that Cam York would lead this team in average time on ice. I, 
saying that's not going to happen. It's going to be Travis Sandheim. So I'll wave that one right now. Uh, let's get to our next question here. And this one comes from Nick Hankins. He says, because of the emergence of Brink and Forster and with Cutter coming, who had a nice weekend, and uh, are Frost and Allison moving closer to trade assets, assets versus pieces for a future Flyers team? We talked about Wade Allison already, and he's got the wake-up call down with the Phantoms right now on the fourth line. But let's talk about Morgan Frost because he's now been scratched three games. John Tortorella said, you know, it wasn't that he played bad, just other guys played better. How does he yeah. get back in? And is it Forster who has to come out to get him back in? Let's uh, let, let's just let's just talk about Forster and Brink real fast, and then I'll get to Morgan. Yep. Um, Brink has been fantastic, um, phenomenal, and it, it shows you how fast things can turn. Because at the, almost the midway point of training camp, I, I, I Brink was a day from going down. The same day that uh, Denoyer went down, he's probably going to be among that batch of cuts. Wow. Then they had that game in Boston where he just played fantastic. Made it, made it, he had to give him another game, and he played really well in that game. Give him another game, he played really well in that game, and all of a sudden he makes the team. Um, and, and, and on merit. And he's just rolled it right into the season. He's been yeah. creating, he's been confident, he's been, um, you know, he, you know, people, he's not the fastest skater per se, but he's got really good quickness. He anticipates well. And quickness is more important than just pure speed. He looks fast. He's looked fast. Because he plays um, fast. He thinks the yeah, game fast. Exactly. He, he, so the, you know, the way that he plays, it, it, it's more important than what a stopwatch says if you time him going around the ring. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm always slow, though, to say emergence of a player because it has to be sustained. Right. Uh, hopefully he doesn't hit a wall. Hopefully he keeps doing what he's doing. Every reason to think right now that he will, but I, I think you just you let him show it. Let him keep keep going. Uh, he certainly totally deserves to stay in the lineup. Um, I, I'll say on on Tyson Forster. Um, I thought he was better. I thought I, I thought he had a, a better game in Dallas. Talked about the takeaway that he had. Um, putting some pucks at the net, which is something that he needs to do. Um, I don't think he's played badly by any stretch. I think he's been fine. Um, do, do I think he's made a statement that that uh, he needs to be in the lineup every game? There's no taking him out of the lineup? No, I don't think I don't think he's done that. Um, I thought his training camp was Meh. all right. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I think his season so far has been all right. Um, you know, he, he, he hasn't, hasn't been, been negative. Right. He's not been negative, right? He hasn't been a liability, so he hasn't done something where he would lose a, a lineup spot and you pull him. But I, I'd like to, I'd like him to see him approach the level that he did in his eight game call up last year. Yeah. Um, or, or being an AHL All Star, or or down the stretch when the Phantoms were was when he went back to Lehigh Valley and they were having to clinch their playoff spot. He had some really big games then. I'd like to see him make a statement that. You're not taking me out of the lineup. I don't think he's done that yet. So I, I wouldn't say he's emerged. I, I, I would say there's potential, but I, I wouldn't say that he, he's emerged yet at this point. And if he goes so, down, like, Twitter, don't freak out. Like, don't yeah. go crazy. You know, right. you're going to see know. some of the young players get a, get a look from above for a game at time to time. Yeah. He'll be, you know, he'll, he'll be back in the lineup. Uh, I have confidence that at some point here he's going to hit a stride similar to what he did last year. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm by no means, I'm, you know, I'm not throwing a wet blanket. I'm, I'm just saying that uh, I think there's another level. There. I, I don't think he's hit it yet. Yeah. Um, On to Frost. With Frost. And, and you know, uh, you know, listen, everybody knows I'm a big Morgan Frost guy. Um, I, I understand staying with the same forward lineup when you're winning, the way the Flyers are winning. Teams quite often do that and, and with justification. So, I think Morgan just has to keep practicing hard. His turn will come up, and then he has to play the way he's capable of when that turn comes up. What uh now you know now what I'll, what I'll say beyond that is listen, Morgan again led the team in scoring for the final two thirds of last season, the final fifty six games. It wasn't for a month. It wasn't for a week. No, it it was two thirds of the season, and it coincided with what he had the opportunity to move up in the lineup. 
and, and honestly, it, it came at Kevin Hayes' expense because when Hayes kind of moved down in December, that's when Frost got the opportunity to play, and that's when his game started taking off. Now, there's, there's room for more consistency, you know, et cetera. I mean, he still has, he still has areas he still has to grow. But still, that, that, that's not a meaningless accomplishment to lead the team in scoring for, for, that, uh, for about a four-month period of time. Um, if you watch the most recent episode, uh, or the, or the, the, the second installment, because it's two, two parts, uh, of The Standard, there's a segment where John Tortorella is talking with Danny Briere and, and talking with Keith Jones. Uh, I think Brent Flair is in the room, and so is Alan McCauley. And um, he, he starts by talking about how he can he can free up Noah Cates a little bit offensively. Mm-hmm. Um, then he says to Frost, he said, listen, give Frosty credit. He, he grew a lot last year as a two-way player. Okay? Uh, so that, that's Torts giving him credit for his growth in his two-way game. Don't take it from me. Um, this preseason, um, and, and Torts and I think Jonesy, I think mean, either Torts and Jonesy or Torts and, and Danny, say, and he had a good preseason this year, had a good camp, um, which also included, again, leading the team in scoring in the preseason. I, I would have liked him to have not been pulled after two games. I would have liked to have seen him get the same trust and leeway that uh, no Owen Tippett, who did not have two two good games to start the season. Actually, you know, he, in, in that Ottawa game where the Flyers struggled, Tippett had maybe his worst game as a Flyer since coming over from Florida. Doesn't mean you pull him. Doesn't doesn't mean you remove him from the lineup. Doesn't mean anything. It just means he had a, a bad game and uh, and a so-so first game in Columbus because in, in either of those two games could he put pucks on the net. Um, now, he's corrected that in the last three games. Tip's been terrific. Um, in the Vancouver game, he had a ton of scoring chances. Um, really, it was only because Thatcher Demko was playing out of his mind that he didn't get in the score sheet. Um, he was he was even better in, in the Edmonton game and uh, you know, had two really, really sweet assists. Um, you know, credit to Cam Atkinson for finishing those, but he just he just just toasted Evan Bouchard on, on both of his assists. He did. Yeah, the backhand just, pass. Yeah, it's just yeah. beautiful, beautiful. And that, you know, and, and, and it was nice. I mean, that, that's we were just talking about earlier how the confidence, if you make a mistake or if you have a bad game, you're back out there again. Yeah. Right? He, he got that show of faith. Um, you know, Noah Cates had one shot, well, not even just one shot, ago, one shot attempt going into the third game, going into the home opener. And then that was at, that was with TK on his line for the first two games. Um, now we all we all know what he is as a two way player, and we all know that you know there's there's some offensive game there, but he he was capable of another level. He had a he had a especially by his standards, by everybody's standards, Otto was a bad game. You know, Frost included. Frost was not very good in the first two games, mm-hmm. but I, I would have liked to have seen Frost have the opportunity to stay in the line. The other guys that emerged last year did. In light of, in light of the length of time that he led the team in scoring, in light of a good camp, and in light of even the head coach crediting his improvements as a two-way player. Um, again, I, I understand keeping the lineup as is. I, you know, when he gets his next chance to play, and it, it'll come. It's not, you know, not a whole season thing. And there's, but he has, you know, he has to take advantage of it. I, I'd like to see, I'd like to see a little patience, you know, yeah, and, and see him see him kind of get back to, to where he left off. I, I think it's an unfortunate situation in, in terms of being uh, of being trade bait. I mean, I, you never, you never know what comes down the line. He signed, he signed a two year deal. And, um, you know, right now Scott Lawton is, is playing well at center and other guys have, have played well. And I, I don't think there's a, an immediate need to make a change and put Morgan back in. Um, hopefully again, hopefully he gets back in pretty soon, gets back to where he left off and, and he's back part of the lineup again and he's a player that you know wanted to obviously continue what he did in that final two-thirds last year get off to a good start and he's found himself in the press box for three straight games um but when he gets that opportunity again he's going to just have to take advantage of it and make it so that they can't pull him out of that lineup again um we'll see where i think he's an important player for the team in so many ways too um both near and long term so um, we'll see how that plays out for sure. Let's get to uh, one more question here coming from Flyer Eric. He says, uh, does this season's fast start feel different than last season? He said, I remember last season 
Carter was on fire at the start and the Flyers were winning because of that. Mostly you kind of touched on that earlier. And yeah. we talked about the, the seven, three and two start. This does look different, Bill. I'm not ready to go crazy after five games. I mean, remember they started seven, three and two last year and then lost 10 straight. So yeah. I'm not going to go crazy and change my expectations. The NHL season is a grind, yeah. um, but it does, it does look different than last year, but we'll see where the warts emerge in time. No, for, for sure. And they're going to emerge, right? They're, they always do. They're going to be rough. There's going to be rough patches this year. Uh, hopefully, now hopefully the Flyers can stay relatively healthy, but but it's going to happen. There, there'll be stretches where the Flyers are having trouble scoring. Um, you know, they, one one area that uh, we have not touched on today, but to just briefly mention, Flyers are, are one for the season so far in the power play, and the one that they have was a five on three goal. Yeah. So they they have to start scoring a little bit on the power play because you're not going to get you know the the, the funny thing about shorthanded goals is that sometimes you might get a, a bunch of them in a short period of time, not usually not usually four of them in two games, but sometimes it feels like you start getting some and then you go a couple months without any. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, <laughs> that, that that's not going to be a regular part of anybody's repertoire. So, uh, you yeah, know, so, so there, there's a lot of things to clean up and a lot of things to work on. I, I do think that they're heading in the right direction and it, it, it does have a – different feel to it but uh, in terms of full season implication you just can't they have been playing long enough yeah we just can't go there to this point yeah. and look they're playing well the hockey's been entertaining i think it's always important to keep in mind that it is a season a long season of up and downs and twists and turns and injuries and overcoming them hot players and players cooling and you know when things do go well enjoy it and, you know, there's nothing wrong with enjoying it. <laughs> you know, sometimes yeah. I, I know some people and I, I got a, some messages on social media. Aren't the Flyers supposed to lose? They need to they need to lose. And, um, you know, to, and I replied to the guy and I just said, look, if you're asking your team to lose, that's a loser's mentality. And that does not wash off your skin easy. No. And, and you know, a, dra a certain draft pick is. You know, it's uh, you can get so obsessed on that, and uh, I, I mentioned this to, to somebody on, a, on another podcast, um, and I, I earlier today actually, that if you look at what of the Flyers' best draft picks been over the last thirty years, it was Simone Gagne who was a twenty-second overall pick. It was certainly Giroux who was a twenty-second yeah. overall pick, and, and I think Justin Williams was a twenty-seventh overall pick, and Konechny's a twenty-fourth overall pick. Yeah, you know, you you can find good players in a lot of different spots. It's not it's not a guarantee that if a guy's not picked in the top five, he's not going to be a player. You just you build a team, you develop the talent that you have, and and you hope that you, you know, you you add pieces around it. But I I don't I'm not somebody who obsesses all the time. Oh, you have to be at the top end of the lottery. It's just look look even last year, Flyers picked seventh, and and Mitchkov fell to them. And yep. he's a potential franchise player. He really is. He's only been a point per game player at 18 years old in the, in the KHL. Tough league. Um, Very tough league. Yep. I'm no math major, but I think that's pretty good. Um, what'd you think of Cutter Gauthier's weekend? Oh, Gauthier. You know, you, last, um, last weekend, last Friday, I think it was Friday, he had 19 shot attempts in the yeah, game. That's insane. Wild. That's <laughs> one. And 11 of them on net, and nothing went in for him then. He, he ended that game somehow without a point. I still don't know how, <laughs> but so he was, he was due, um, you know, and he scored two really nice goals, um, you know, in, in, in Friday's game. Um, he, he loves to shoot the puck, you know, he, and he's a damn good shooter. Um, what, what's uh, wild about him is how fast the puck gets on the net and how accurate he usually is. Yeah. Um, his, his favorite shooting spot is the, uh, the right circle. It, it could be the above the dot or down to the dot, and maybe the top of the circle sometimes. But if you if you can see them that shot, it's quite often going to be in the net, and he and he gets rid of it in a hurry. Uh, and he, you know, and he's never met a shot he won't take, which is good. It's good to have some guys with the shooting mentality. Um, you know, I and, and the, the thing with Gautier, you know, and he'd be a good guy to, to do something a lengthier piece on. I think at some point, um, he's a good passer too. Yeah, uh, he doesn't. He doesn't have a distributor's instincts. He much prefers to shoot than to pass. But uh, you know, but he actually, it's actually a pretty good passer on top of it. But but his uh, 
his shot is, is really, you know, his best asset. And he's going to score a lot of goals. Yeah. I, He's a guy I think he's a guy I think will be a, a 35 goal scorer regularly and might have a 40 goal year or two. Yeah, he um is not afraid to take that shot from distance either and finds the back of the net. And that's not an easy thing to do for sure. So um we'll be monitoring his season as well. Great stuff, Bill. As always, give Bill a follow on Twitter at Bill Melter. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll preview Flyers, Vegas, late, very late. Did I mention it's late? Uh, late night hockey tomorrow night. Uh, so tune in for that. Rebuilds work at PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. We'll talk to you tomorrow on a brand new Flyers Daily.